This is the flag that inspired a rebellion, that inspired those at Eureka. It was sown in secret. The people sheltering in the Eureka stockade didn't want to change the system of government. They wanted to be included in it. They weren't insurgents. They were not revolutionaries. They rebelled against vicious treatment by police when all peaceful means of protest had failed. They sowed a flag and built a fence. They fought back. And today all of us are the beneficiaries of their fight. The story of the Eureka Stockade is more than just a famous battle in our history. It's a fundamental milestone on Australia's road to democracy. In today's episode, we will travel back to the 1850s and walk with the gold miners and their families from Bakery Hill to the Eureka Stockade. This is Peter Laylaw. He was elected as a Victorian Member of Parliament in 1856 and served as the Speaker of the House here for seven years from 1880 to 1887. But in 1854, after leading a rebellion of gold miners at Eureka, 27-year-old Peter Laylaw was the most wanted man in Australia, with a reward of over $25,000 for anyone who handed him into the police. How Peter Laylaw went from rebellious fugitive to a long-standing Member of Parliament in only two years is just one small part of the fascinating story of democracy in Australia. The Eureka Stockade is often referred to as the Eureka Legend or a revolution. The reality is just a sad story of violent bloodshed. It's the events before and after Eureka that are legendary in their own right and were the foundation for a freedom we take for granted today. Over 270 soldiers were instructed to attack the stockade built at the Eureka mining site at 4 a.m. on Sunday morning. They silently surrounded the sleeping miners in the stockade. There was a 15-minute battle. The diggers in the stockade at the time were asleep, outnumbered, outgunned and unskilled fighters. The tragedy happened after the battle. It was bayonets, not bullets, that did the most damage. Crazed soldiers and police thrust their blades into the dead and dying. Others surrounded tents and sliced and jabbed at the bullet-riddled canvas. Then the order was given to burn to the ground all the tents in the stockade and vicinity. Tents were set alight with people still asleep in them or still containing bodies of wounded or dead. By the time the sun was up, it was all over. The troops and police returned to their camp cheering. Meanwhile, the people of Ballarat woke to the smell of burning canvas and the sounds of weeping. A local man wrote in his diary, The brave, noble hearts did not turn their swords on armed men, but galloped among the tents, shooting at women and cutting down defenceless men, new widows recognizing the bloody remains of a slaughtered husband, children screaming and crying around a dead father, cowardly and monstrous cruelties, it is a dark, indelible stain on a British government. Just seven days after Victoria declared its independence from New South Wales, gold was found in central Victoria. When gold was discovered, it seemed that overnight, the workers of Australia had gone AWOL. Farms, building sites, ships, police barracks, government offices, shearing sheds, all were deserted. News of Victoria's supposedly infinite supply of gold 
was shared in newspapers and letters in London, Edinburgh, Dublin, Paris, Warsaw, Munich, Washington, Toronto and Shanghai. And the people rushed to Victoria. The early diggers of the 1850s were not the professional miners of the 1860s, a decade later. They were individual speculators, anxious about their family's living conditions, eager to make their fortune with gold and go home. Gold mining was backbreaking hard work with no guarantee of a find. For every family that did well, two or three lived in complete poverty. In order to dig, each miner had to purchase a monthly gold license like this one, which cost the equivalent of one week's wages. The license fee was a head tax, not an income tax, and it was instantly detested by all the miners. You could sink a shaft next to your neighbour. You could both wallow in the dark and wet earth for five, six, nine months bailing out the constant seeping water. And your neighbour might find the gold-infused riverbed, while your hole leads only to a bend in the underground river, missing the gold completely. He wins, you lose. But you still have to pay your licence fee, month in, month out, gold or no gold. Digger hunts were conducted five days a week. 16 bullies on horseback, their muskets loaded and swords drawn, would descend on the diggings. Accompanied by 50 soldiers on foot, armed with clubs, they would demand each digger show their licence on the spot. Those without a licence, even if it was left in a tent, would be chained to tree logs once the tiny lockup was full. Honest but poor licence defaulters were chained together with hardened thieves and assorted ex-convicts from Van Diemen's land. Women were incarcerated with men. This is Bakery Hill in Ballarat. It's at a junction of several key roads in the city. Today, it's filled with shops and restaurants. In 1854, Bakery Hill was much the same. It was the natural hub of Goldfields activity because all roads met in this natural gully. It was here that the hotels, gold buyers and merchants congregated. On the 11th of November, 1854, a scorching hot Sunday, 10,000 people met here at Bakery Hill to complain about the police and the license hunts. The Ballarat community, wanted to express outrage that their licence fees were used to support a police force that did not prevent crime and was mostly corrupt. At this meeting, the Ballarat Reform League was established. They drafted a document, the Ballarat Reform League Charter. We can easily read this document today at the old Treasury building in Melbourne. Anyone can freely visit the old Treasury building here in Melbourne and wander into this room. Here under glass is the faded blue paper of an original copy of the Ballarat Reform League Charter. In this quiet room, it can be easy to forget the angst and frustration that resulted in the drafting of this document. The Bakery Hill meeting on the 11th of November, 1854, is now considered the first formal step on the march to Australian democracy. What did the diggers write in their charter? The charter laid out five basic demands. Free and fair representation for all in parliament, votes for all men without any property conditions, ability of any person to stand for election to the Legislative Council, salaries for those elected, and fixed terms for those elected. Sound familiar? Each of these five points we take for granted today. Each of them are vital to the operation of Australia's federal elections. The members of the Ballarat Reform League didn't just pull these requests from thin air. To understand why they made these requests, we need to look at the background of the members themselves.
This is a map that is part of the Eureka Memorial in Ballarat. Those who immigrated in their thousands to the Victorian gold fields aspired to something different from the old power structures they knew at home. These dates on the memorial are a code for understanding the demands in the Ballarat Reform League Charter. 1776 was the American War of Independence. Many miners in Ballarat came from California, bringing with them values of personal freedom and independence. 1789 was the French Revolution, which shocked Europe when it deposed a monarchy and established a French Republic. 1798 was the Irish War of Independence, and many miners were Irish. 1848 saw the formation of Italy as a country. In 1854, all of these global forces for change and revolution are not just dull history lessons for the miners, the diggers here in Ballarat. They are lived experiences, topics for newspaper articles and debate. The very fabric of the social structure of the world was being tested and changed through these events. This was the melting pot of Eureka. Every single miner was aware of some kind of cultural struggle or change in their home countries. On the 29th of November, at another monster meeting on Bakery Hill of 15,000 people, almost half the total population of Ballarat at the time, many diggers lined up to throw their licenses on a bonfire, an act of communal protest. A flag was hoisted, not a national flag, but a purpose-made flag. This is the flag that we now know as the Eureka flag. The people of Ballarat called it the Australian flag. It was inspired by the one thing that united each and every resident of Ballarat, the constellation of the Southern Cross. Those five bright stars were the first thing that immigrants saw when they crossed the invisible line in the ocean into the Southern Hemisphere. The Victorian governor had rejected the charter presented by the Ballarat Reform League. The diggers felt under siege, ignored by the governor, no elected leader to represent them, and persecuted by the local authorities. They burned their licenses in protest under a flag that united them and then went home. The next day, the soldiers and police decided to show force by instigating a massive license hunt. The mounted police began to gallop among the tents, firing shots into the crowded tents where women and children were sheltering. The confused crowd tried to scatter. Police were pelted with mud, stones and broken bottles. Soldiers dropped to one knee and aimed their guns at the people. Miners jumped down holes and women and men tried to disappear behind tents. As news of the chaos and random firing on the crowd, including women and children, spread, other sympathetic diggers downed tools to seek information. From all directions on the diggings, people walked in the direction of Bakery Hill. The Australian flag was once again flying. Those who came had lost faith in the government. Through hunger, grief, shame, disappointment, harassment, indignity, humiliation and powerlessness. The object was now self-defence. The leaders of Ballarat had shown that they would fire upon a civilian crowd. This was the way masters treated servants and dogs. The people looked for a leader and from the crowd stepped 27-year-old Irishman Peter Laylor. His father was an Irish MP and his eldest brother had fought in the Young Irish Movement in Ireland. Peter Laylor stepped from the crowd and led the assembled group of 1,000 diggers, wives and children on a march from Bakery Hill to Eureka. They took the flag with them. The group now led by Peter Laylor decided to throw up a hasty barricade 
There needed to be a place of shelter to protect those diggers who had burned their licenses. They grabbed any suitable material they could find to build a barricade. Overturned carts, empty barrels, felled trees, thick slabs used to line mine shafts. When it was finished, Peter Laylor led the group back to Bakery Hill and raised the Australia flag. He then kneeled, removed his hat and raised his hand towards the flag and made this oath. We swear by the flag of the Southern Cross to stand truly by each other and fight to defend our rights and liberties. The group moved back down the hill to the stockade. It was sunset Thursday evening. There would be a standoff until just before dawn Sunday morning. Twice over the next two days, Peter Laylor sent representatives to the government camp to try to negotiate a suspension of the license hunts until the people had the opportunity to put their case against the licensing system to the governor. The representatives were ignored. During the day, there were at least 1,500 people crammed into the stockade. Most slept in their own tents at night as the stockade was to prevent the arrest of unlicensed diggers and there had never been a license hunt at night. The diggers expected that Sunday would be the customary day of rest and many of them left the stockade on Saturday evening to do things with their families. The stockade emptied out. Even the local priest encouraged everyone in the stockade to come to church on Sunday. Many of the soldiers at Ballarat had been on 24-hour sentry duty for days, without sleep, washing or changing clothes, and it had been pouring rain overnight. The soldiers and police were badly paid and living in cramped conditions. Over 540 weary soldiers were kept on constant alert by the military captain, fed on rumours of an imminent attack. The order was given to march on the stockade at 2 a.m. The soldiers eagerly made their way here to this ground. Today, Eureka is a lovely park, tall trees and a playground that's constructed to look like a stockade with soldiers out the front. In fact, it's so peaceful, we have to try very, very hard to imagine the chaos, panic, fear and death that happened here. Following the battle, many miners and soldiers lay dead. Later that day, most of the dead miners were carried in rough coffins on drays here to Ballarat Old Cemetery and buried in a common grave. This monument marks the location and lists their names. This is it, the flag that inspired a rebellion, that inspired those who were downtrodden to take a stand. There are squares missing because the soldiers cut out souvenirs. But it's still beautiful, isn't it? It was sewn in secret, such a massive flag to sew secretly. The people in Ballarat were not disloyal to the Queen. They didn't want to change the system of government. They just wanted to be included in it. At no time did they launch an assault on authorities. They were not insurgents. They were not revolutionaries. They rebelled against an unpopular and viciously policed tax when all peaceful means of protest had been rebuffed. They fought back when attacked by the military in a preemptive strike intended to restore government authority without listening to the people. They sewed a flag and built a fence. Thirteen miners were selected to face charges of high treason. The trials dissolved in farce, making a laughing stock of the government. No jury would convict the miners and there was no evidence of treason. A royal commission investigating the goldfields, recommending that the licensing laws 
be replaced with a system where miners paid a tax on gold they found rather than on the possibility of finding gold. The mining license was replaced by a one pound yearly miner's right. Peter Laylor came out of hiding and in 1855, he was one of the two diggers leaders voted into the Legislative Assembly to represent Ballarat. So one year after the Eureka violence, the miners had representation in Parliament. Within three years, the right to vote was given to all male British subjects over the age of 21. This is the legendary result of Eureka. But equality wasn't given to all. Australia had to wait another 48 years before the passing of the Commonwealth Franchise Act in 1902 gave white women full political equality with men and made Australia the most democratic nation in the world. Aboriginal men and women would not receive these rights until the 1960s. Many of the issues simmering in Ballarat during 1854 were the result of poor actions by leaders in government, police and military. Corrupt leaders, selfish leaders, power-hungry leaders, leaders greedy for money and prestige. Today, we have the right to choose our political leaders who then regulate the laws that govern our police and military. It's a right we take for granted today. But in 1854, a bonfire of injustice and violence burned many who had been suffering in poverty without the right of representation. So how can we show that we appreciate the legacy of Eureka? How can we show that we value the gift of being able to have a say in the selection of our representatives in government? Well, while in prison, the Apostle Paul wrote many letters. In one letter to Timothy, Paul reminded him about the power of prayer in supporting leaders. Here's what Paul wrote. The first thing I want you to do is pray. Pray every way you know how, for everyone you know. Pray especially for rulers and their governments to rule well, so we can be quietly about our business of living simply in humble contemplation. This is the way our Saviour God wants us to live. So we're encouraged to pray for our government leaders. Pray that they will govern justly and honourably and in the best interests of our society. Pray that they will govern with wisdom and that their concern will be for the well-being of all. And pray that God will accomplish His purpose through them. Let's ensure that we don't take our democracy and freedom for granted. We need to remember that this freedom was paid for in blood at Eureka Stockade. Eureka is a reminder of the eternal human dream for liberty, equality and freedom. A dream that belongs to everyone. A dream that will never perish from the earth. Why? Because God has placed the desire for freedom in our hearts. We weren't made to be slaves. We were designed to be free. And we cannot be satisfied or find peace until we are free. And this is true in a spiritual sense as well. True freedom, freedom from guilt and sin, can only be found in Jesus. You see, being a slave to sin is the ultimate bondage. The freedom that Jesus offers is a spiritual freedom from the guilt and bondage of sin. Listen to what it says in John chapter 8, verses 32 to 36. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Jesus is the truth. Knowing the truth, knowing Jesus, sets us free from sin, free from guilt and free from condemnation. Wouldn't you like to experience that freedom, true freedom? Well, you can. Why not ask for it right now as we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, today we have been reminded of the importance of freedom and just how precious it is. We admire those who have championed the cause of liberty and democracy. Today, we want to recognize the greatest of liberators, Jesus Christ, and thank you for the freedom that he brings to our lives. 
Thank you for setting us free from sin and guilt. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The story of Eureka Stockade and the struggle for democracy and freedom is certainly inspiring and has influenced the history of our country. If you've enjoyed this Eureka Stockade program and would like to know more about the freedom from guilt and sin that Jesus offers, be sure to order the free gift we have for all our viewers today. It's a book entitled, The Secrets of Freedom. It's an insightful guide that will help you overcome the paralysis we sometimes feel when we are tied down by guilt, anger, failures, and the past. This book is our gift to you and is absolutely free. There are no cost or obligations. Order your free book now. Here's the information you need. Phone or text us at 0436 333 55 or visit our website www.tij.tv to request today's free offer and we'll send it to you totally free of charge and with no obligation. So don't delay. Call or text 0436 333 55 in Australia or 020 422 2042 New Zealand or visit our website www.tij.tv to request today's offer. Write to us at PO Box 5101 Dora Creek, New South Wales, 2264 Australia or PO Box 76673 Manukau, Auckland, 2241 New Zealand. Don't delay. Call or text us now. If you've enjoyed today's journey, be sure to join us again next week when we will share another of life's journeys together and experience another new and thought-provoking perspective on the peace, insight, understanding and hope that only the Bible can give us. The incredible journey truly is television that changes lives. Until next week, remember the ultimate destination of life's journey. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away.